Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Vincenzo Berghel. It's my pleasure again to have you here at uh, the next uh, live uh, at uh, Age of FM. As you can see, I have lots of great friends with me uh, today, which I'll introduce as I see them actually on the screen here. Uh, Joanna Quiz Nelson from UNC. Hi, Joe. Uh, Brad uh, DeVries uh, from Sydney, Australia. Hi, Brad. We have Ala Phipps as well from Sydney, Australia, where it is April 1st. What is it, 8 <laughs> in the morning, Ala? Yes, it is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it's evening here in Philadelphia, but it's a brand new day in Australia. They're ahead of us, and you'll see they're ahead of us in many ways. Then we have Julie Bird, uh, one of our residents, going to wash you. Hi, Julie. And we have Federica Bellucci also here in Philadelphia. Hi, Federica. Great. So I'll... Uh, um, go to my slides. I'm very excited uh, to to um, you know to be here today and to uh, talk about minor rotation. That would be our um, our talk today. Um, the um, and again, we, we call this uh, live um, at Age of MFM. I could also say live um, at Age of MFM because I. We had over 1,000 uh, people watch us live uh, last week, and um, we'll continue this weekly, as you'll see. I'll announce at the end, and we're very happy we have so many followers. So, again, the talk today is on um, minor rotations for model position. And I want to go back real quick um, on primates and how we really have evolved, uh, and we have a much bigger brain, a much different skull. Um, and for example, in chimpanzee, it's normal to give birth uh, OP, occipital posterior, versus in humans, um, we usually try to give birth in OA, and it's much easier, as we'll talk uh, today. In fact, in, in chimpanzee and, and other primates, um, it's so easy to give birth uh, OP that the baby comes out without any rotation, doesn't have to rotate anywhere, um, and the mother can actually catch the baby herself and uh, act the baby, uh, feed the baby, um, et cetera. So it's, it's much different. And what's much different, as you can, as, as you know, is that the pelvis, it's uh, so much roomier in, in uh, uh, other primates, um, while in humans, it's kind of a tight uh, fit. Um, and in fact, uh, let me go um, to here, my little model. Uh, and uh, this, we do have, we have a black baby, but it doesn't fit in this pelvis. But if I can show you, the baby uh, comes up uh, kind of, you know, transverse and then needs to rotate. And I rotate from below, like we would do a manual rotation. Um, and, uh, you know, when a baby instead is OP, is the other way around, should you um, rotate um, using the hand um, and move the head up or rotate with your hand or rotate with the fingers? And is this safe or dangerous for the baby? As the baby comes um, through the through kind of a narrow pelvis, um, back to the to the slides, uh, the um, incident, um, as you can see here, um, we wouldn't go full screen, is that um, in the first stage, the incidence of um, um, being OP is, as you can see, about 30, 35 uh, percent of the pink column. Uh, in the first stage. In the early second stage, that comes down to about 15, 20 percent in most studies, and it's only 5 uh, percent in um, a delivery in, in most studies. And then similar, a little bit less for OT. So if you look at 145 million birds and you do all the calculations, really in the early second stage, OP is not that uncommon. And, and um, um, there could be one OP every second worldwide. So this is an issue that comes up, you know, all the time. Um, and um, it's an issue that it's associated uh, being posterior or transverse with longer so-called difficult labors. Um, and we've known this forever, especially a longer second stage, more chorioaminitis, most postpartum hemorrhage, less vaginal deliveries, more C-sections and more operative vaginal delivery, which we'll talk about. There could be more severe perinatal lacerations, lower APGAR scores, pH for the baby, more neonatal trauma, and NSU emission. So 
lots of complications which we're trying to avoid and talk about today in terms of manual rotation. Rotation was discussed even almost 300 years ago in terms of doing an operative vaginal delivery. Dr. Smelly had talked about that, and Dr. Tournier in, um, in France was the first one, as far as I could tell, to report a manual um, rotation. Until recently, before COVID, BC, I only saw one run of my studies from our Australian group here of only 30 patients. So when people talk to me as a clinician about doing uh, rotation, I'm like, you know, we don't know anything about it. We have 30 patients randomized in the whole literature. But then in 2018, went to this wonderful conference and met Ala and Phipps, who were presenting the results of the randomized studies. We discussed it. And eventually, the Pink Journal wasn't even alive at the time, didn't even exist. Uh, but sure enough, eventually, uh, the wonderful randomized study was published. And now about, you know, a year ago, in January 2021, um, then uh, another trial that hadn't been published yet, but it represented as MFM was published. And Aaron Coy and his collaborator, um, Dr. Pelusi, wrote the editorial for Pop Out. Brad um, will talk about the turnout trial published in September in the Pink Journal. And um, finally, um, last month, uh, Julie um, and Joe and others uh, published uh, this. Um, systematic review and meta-analysis of the randomized studies. So many controversies to talk about, and I'll pass it on to Ala uh, soon. Uh, but how do you make the diagnosis? Always by ultrasound. What degrees are really OP or OT? Flexion, deflection, or syncretism? Or is OP that different from OT? And especially on the technique. How do you do it? When do you do it? Who does it? Do you use ultrasound during and after? How long do you repeat it? Can you really do a well-controlled sham study? What is the safety for the mom and the baby, the efficacy? If we can turn the baby, but there's no other outcome, is that good enough? And does the mother you know, like it or hate it? I'll stop there um, and uh, pass it on to Ala, and uh, she will go over the first trial. Um, I understand, Ala, as you can take over, you actually um, have been working on this uh, since um, 2006. Uh, it's a lifetime uh, achievement. Congratulations and please uh, take over. Thank you, Vincent. Um, uh, Brad and I started a conversation in 2006 talking about manual rotation and that we practice it, those that do practice it, and, and that I wonder what is in the literature. So we did a detailed research. Uh, uh, I guess, a literature review and realized that there was absolutely no studies on the efficacy of manual rotation. So um, what is manual rotation? As Vincenzo has touched on, it is something that's been around for a very long time. Midwives and doctors do practice it either prophylactically when a woman is in, uh, in uh, when they diagnose a malposition, a posterior or a transverse, and they let the lady continue to push on and deliver after rotation or before an instrumented delivery. Uh, you can see that the, there's several techniques, either the hand is used or the uh, rotation um, through the digital. Uh, but anyway, the technique does vary and um, that's good to know, but it's all about what is the efficacy of manual rotation. So uh, we um, decided that we really want to know, we want to see what the evidence is, we want to start that journey. So in order to undertake uh, two trials on malposition, two trials, we really wanted to know what is the operative delivery rate for the posterior position. So we undertook a prospective observational study and we found out that 68% is the operative delivery rate which informed our sample size. And then we thought, all right, what is is it feasible to undertake an RCT considering we want to do a sham arm, which is obviously the highest level being pragmatic trial, being a blinded trial, uh, will give us the real evidence. So we undertook a feasibility study and we wanted to know, do the midwives and the women themselves support this um, sham arm? And we, we found out through completion of this pilot study, yes, sham arm is acceptable by both the midwives and the clinic do doctors. So then we wondered, well, what is the clinically significant reduction 
that is perceived by both the midwives and the doctors. So we did two national surveys and we found that both the doc midwives and doctors were in agreement that 50% is a significant reduction. And this informed both our trials. Now, what we wanted to know, what is the OT position's operative delivery? There was nothing in the literature once again about it at all. So we did our own study and we found 49% is, is an operative delivery, which is significant. So we, we designed and published the protocols of the two trials. Um, and uh, we then decided that uh, with the aim being that um, what is the efficacy of manual rotation for the, for the posterior position, which is the pop-out trial and the turnout trial being the, for the transverse position in second stage of labor. Next slide, thank you. So the aim is the same for both trial. It is to assess the efficacy of manual rotation from either the OP or the OT position in the second stage of labor for preventing operative delivery. So our study design for the both trials is the same. It is a multi-center, double-blinded, parallel superiority RCT. Our population was having an uncomplicated pregnancy, being term, being cephalic, and having a mouth position in the second stage of labor on ultrasound. We chose to, to use the four quadrants as in the way of diagnosing malposition, which is what we use for the OP study and the pilot study. As far as the arms of the study, we wanted prophylactic manual rotation at one hour of full dilatation or with the first urge to push, with the idea that we're after the persistent OP or the OT position and not those that may rotate or, uh, um, by themselves. So the control arm being an identical sham procedure without rotating the baby. So Brad and many others had to be actors. <laughs> so our outcomes being that for both trials that operative delivery is the primary outcome and secondary being caesarean section, combined maternal morbidity mortality and a combined perinatal morbidity and mortality. As you can see, there are um, many um, factors that we are concerns us about malposition and this is the combined maternal outcome. So the adverse effect um, outcomes for the same for the baby. These are the list of the adverse perinatal outcomes that we'd be concerned about for malposition. And then we excluded really predominantly any um, high risk of uh, the primary outcome occurring, which includes a brow face presentation, previous caesarean section, and the list continues. Our sample size for, for each of the trials was we used the standard method for sample size um, calculation with the OP position, the reduction from 68% to 50% required 127 women in each arm. And then for the, for the OT position from 49% to 35%, we require 208 women in each arm. So four major hospitals in Australia took part in this study, both trials. And how does this work? So a woman is fully dilated, an ultrasound is performed by either a registrar or a midwife. The, uh, the investigator on call, who was 24 hours on call, is called... They come in, they perform another ultrasound to ensure the position has not turned and then ensure the woman still wants to participate in the study and then we randomise the woman to either arm. And then another ultrasound is repeated to ensure that the position has turned or not, but no one knows what the outcome is but the investigator who then leaves and routine care continues. And now I'll hand over to Brad. Yeah. Hello everybody, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Brad, as I've been introduced already, and I'm an obstetrician and clinical researcher in Sydney, Australia. I'll just present the results of our trials. So for the posterior pop-out trial, we met our sample size calculation of uh, 254 women, and the vast majority received their allocated intervention. Note that about 10% of women in each trial had a manual rotation later in the second stage. Um, whether on whichever arm they were allocated to. An analysis was by intention to treat. Unfortunately, we didn't meet our sample size calculation for the transverse turnout trial, where we randomised 160 and uh, we were intending 416. But unfortunately, we ran out of um, funding and endurance. These are our baseline characteristics. 
They were very similar in each group of the pop-out trial, with perhaps slightly more women of Southeast Asian background in the manual rotation group. Um, these boxes aren't quite aligned, so so um, more than 80% of women were malliparous, and more than um, about 90% of women had an epidural in the first stage of labour. Again, these boxes aren't aligned, but similarly for the turnout trial, there were more than 80% of women were nulliparous and 90% um, of women had an epidural earlier in the course of their labour. These are our main results. So in our sham arm, 71% of women had an operative birth compared with 62% in the rotation arm. A difference which unfortunately was not quite was not statistically significant. These numbers were 54% and 45% for instrumental births, referring to either forceps births or, or vacuum births. These are the same results for the transverse trial, where the rates of operative birth were actually close to identical in both arms of the trial at about 50%. We did a planned subgroup analysis by operator experience and found that for more experienced operators having performed more than 20 prophylactic manual rotations in the past, the rates of operative birth were 73% in the sham arm compared with 62% in the manual rotation arm, which also wasn't quite statistically significant. But we feel overall there's some suggestion here that experience may play an important role. This was a requested subgroup analysis by one of the reviewers for our submitted manuscript. We wanted to know the results for uh, when the baby's head was flexed at the time of attempted rotation in the posterior study. And to our surprise, the differences in um, operative delivery was 75% versus 44%. And that was statistically significant. I think that was a post hoc analysis. and relatively small numbers. So I think at this stage, it needs to be taken with a grain of salt, but it's something that would be of interest um, to future research. These are our secondary maternal outcomes, which were similar in both arms of the trial for adverse maternal outcomes. We thought perhaps there were more third and fourth degree perineal tears in the sham arm compared with the rotation arm. I thought this might be um, clinically important, but then in the transverse trial, we found a trend in the exact opposite direction so we can only conclude that it's highly likely that um, manual rotation makes no difference to this particular outcome. This is the secondary outcomes for the, the infant adverse outcomes, which are very similar in both arms of both trials. Uh, other outcomes were similar in both arms for the pop-out trial. In terms of success of the procedure defined as actually turning to the OA position, um, this was 61% in the pop-out trial turning to OA, 17% um, could be seen as maybe partially successful turning to the occiput transverse position and 22% didn't um, move from the posterior position and were unsuccessful. This is a similar table for the transverse trial. Um, in, for women where the baby was rotated, the average length of the second stage was shorter by about 12 minutes. In terms of success of the procedure, it was 88% successful from transverse to um, anterior position compared with 12% of babies not turning from the transverse position. Uh, for our follow-up outcome, longer term follow-up outcomes up to one year, uh, there was no difference in breastfeeding, depression, quality of life, or the Australian pelvic floor function questionnaire administered at 12 months. Um, there was a slight increase in maternal satisfaction for women who had a rotation compared with a sham procedure, which is a result we're not sure about how to explain. Uh, we did something unusual in our trial in that after we did our manual rotation or sham procedure, we asked the midwife to guess which one we did. And um, the midwife guessed that it was a manual rotation about the same amount of the time, regardless of whether she was uh, allocated to manual rotation or sham, which we think supports the idea that um, blinding was effective in our trials. So in summary, prophylactic manual rotation was not associated with operative delivery or specifically caesarean section or serious adverse maternal or perinatal morbidity. Intrapartum research is very challenging. We actually 
consented more than 6,000 women to get our relatively small sample size. Um, and what happened, of course, was that the vast majority of those women consented before labour, had a baby in the anterior position or a rapid labour, and uh, never became eligible for our trial. Strengths include randomisation and blinding of clinicians. Um, the weaknesses include a possible contamination with about 10% of women having a manual rotation later in labour, um, regardless of what arm they were allocated to, and that efficacy may depend on operator experience, which is hard to measure. I'd like to thank all of the funders for our trial listed here and all of my co our co-investigators. Um, with special mention to Dr. John Party from the Nepean Hospital who taught me how to perform a manual rotation many years ago. Uh, to Professor John Hyatt, who was a chief investigator along with Harla and myself, who somehow managed to convince the ethics committee that it was a good idea to have a sham arm in our trials. And um, Dr. Sabrina Kwa from Adelaide, South Australia, who was a site investigator who recruited, recruited many women to our trial and without whom it would not, not have been possible. Uh, thank you. That was fantastic, Alain, Brad, as I, <laughs> as I knew it would be. One thing I want to highlight, you know, Ala Phipps is a midwife, is a research PhD midwife, and Brad is an obstetrician, and, and it's really wonderful to see such incredible collaboration. You know, I wish I saw that, you know, more and more often around the world that we can talk more about later. Another thing I want to say, Brad, um, we're not blinded anymore. You know, your trial was beautifully blinded. But Dr. Belusi was the reviewer who suggested your sub-analysis postdoc. <laughs> now we can reveal some of the <laughs> things that was her idea. Uh, with that, I'm going to move it on to the next uh, speaker, uh, Julie. Uh, take it away. I'll, uh, I'll bring up your slides. Go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Bergella. Um, so it's my pleasure to present our systematic review and meta-analysis of randomized control trials um, in labor. So with this preponderance of new randomized control trials released about manual rotation, we wanted to look to see if doing a manual rotation of the occiput posterior or occiput transverse position altered the rate of spontaneous vaginal delivery. To this end, we searched five databases, Medline, Ovid, Scopus, clinicaltrials.gov, and the Cochrane Central Register of Controlled Trials uh, from inception until July of 2021. Our inclusion criteria were any randomized control trials of cephalic singleton gestations at greater than 37 weeks who were in the OP or the OT position in the first or second stage of labor. We excluded multiple gestations, those who were preterm and anyone with a contraindication to a vaginal delivery. Our review was prospectively registered with Prospero and our risk of bias assessment was performed using the Cochrane Handbook for Systematic Reviews. Our statistics were done using Review Manager 5.4.1 and we used a random effects model of Dersimonian and Laird. When data was unavailable in the published trials, we reached out to the primary authors and in all six trials, authors were willing to share data with us, including Dr. Phipps and Dr. DeVries, for which we we're very grateful. Uh, below is the Prisma flow diagram of all of the included studies. After duplicates were, reviewed, were removed, a total of 644 articles were reviewed for possible inclusion within our meta-analysis. Seven were in, reviewed at full length and one trial was excluded due to concern that it may not be a randomized trial and multiple interventions were executed within the trial. A total of six patients were included in the system or six studies were included within the systematic review and meta-analysis. The characteristics of the six studies are included below. The 2014 Graham study is the feasibility trial out of the group from Australia that was discussed. Phipps in 2021 and uh, DeFries in 2021 were the pop-out and turnout trials. We additionally had uh, Dr. Broberg's trial from the United States and two trials out of France by Drs. Blanc and Drs. Verhey, both published in 2021 as well. 
A total of 498 patients had a manual rotation between the six trials and 504 patients were in the control group. Three of the trials included the sham rotation arm, while three trials had no sham procedure, just no rotation within the control group. There was a high degree of homogeneity between the trials in that all trials had manual rotation at complete cervical dilation before uh, commencing pushing up, otherwise there was a prophylactic rotation. The primary outcome for four of the trials was operative delivery, including C-section, vacuum, and forceps. One trial used length of the second stage as the primary outcome, and one used rate of spontaneous vaginal delivery. Below is our risk of bias assessment. In general, the risk of bias was considered low in most trials. As discussed, three had no sham procedure, so there was a high risk of blinding bias. And two studies had a high risk of other bias as there was rotation of the control group in a significant proportion of patients. Uh, below are the demographics of the included patients averaged over all six trials. The average BMI was around 25 or 26. 77% of patients were nulliparous. Epidurals were used in greater than 95% of patients. And the average patient was around 40 weeks gestation. Approximately one third of the labors were induced. Below are the outcomes of all included patients within this study. For our primary outcome, the rate of spontaneous vaginal delivery, there was no difference between the manual rotation group and the control group with a relative risk of 1.07. There was no difference in any other maternal outcomes, including rate of operative delivery, C-section, length of the second stage, high order lacerations, or postpartum hemorrhage. In the over 900 patients, there was one cord prolapse in the manual rotation arm for a total of a 0.2% rate of umbilical cord prolapse. Looking at our neonatal outcomes, there was no statistically significant uh, difference in low APGAR scores, intraventricular hemorrhage, subgaleal hemorrhage, or NICU admissions. We were able to perform subgroup analysis of OT and OP position only. So in the OT position only, there were 86 uh, patients who were manually rotated and 87 in the control arm. And there were no differences in any of the primary or secondary outcomes between groups. When we look at our subgroup analysis of OP only, we do note that there's one statistically significant difference which is a decrease in the length of the second stage of labor by approximately 12.8 minutes. There's no difference in any other maternal or neonatal outcomes. We notably also did perform a subgroup analysis on all patients of whole hand versus digital rotation and found no difference between success rates or outcomes uh, with whole hand versus digital rotation. In conclusion, we demonstrated that manual rotation does not ameliorate many of the known risks of OP or OT positioning, but that for those in the OP position, we did find a decrease in the length of the second stage by approximately 12.8 minutes. Given no finding of significant neonatal harms and the possibility of shortening the second stage, we believe that it's reasonable to offer manual rotation of the occiput posterior fetus uh, to laboring mothers. Notably, this has been a recent hot topic, and a few weeks before our trial was published, um, AJOG published a meta-analysis by a different group of authors who did it as well, a meta-analysis of randomized control trials of manual rotation in labor. The main difference between these trials was the inclusion of a seventh trial within their meta-analysis. Um, and they found an increase in the rate of vaginal deliveries in the manual rotation group, as well as a decrease in the rate of episiotomies. In response to their trial, or in, in response to their meta-analysis, we wrote a recent letter to the editor of AJOG about our concern about the inclusion of the seventh trial, which we had elected to remove from our meta-analysis. 
Uh, our concerns include that there are four separate interventions within that trial, and it's unclear how many of those patients were manually rotated or who experienced those other interventions. It's also unclear if it is a randomized control trial. Finally, that the Yang trial holds a large weight within their meta-analysis, accounting for 29% of their included patients. All that being said, we all come to the same conclusion that manual rotation of the OP fetus may have benefits for mom um, in decreasing the length of the second stage and potentially increasing the vaginal delivery rate uh, and should be offered to laboring patients. And thank you so much for letting us share our work. Thank you very much, uh, Julie. That was awesome. Um, a couple of quick comments before I pass it on to, to Federica. One is, it's amazing. You know, we went from 30 patients, you know, the pilot, you know, from, from our friends, Alan and, and Brad, 2014, 2021, you know, the year of minor rotation of publication. And now we have over a thousand patients. And so we can finally talk about something. You know, we can finally talk about level one evidence, which with the Pink Journal is all about. So I'm really, really grateful for that. Um, I did ask uh, to the great journal, Julie, about your letter, which is published. Um, apparently, the, the the authors of the Adam analysis declined the, the, the right to, to reply. Um, so more, more to discuss for the future. With that, I can pass it on to uh, Dr. Belusi, um, who will uh, kind of talk more about the ultrasound uh, part. Um, I don't know if you want to share your slides, Federica, or you want me to do it? Yeah. Yes. So um, I was very interested in this trial since uh, uh, almost since you started because uh, I was uh, looking for uh, some evidence about manual rotation and so I uh, looking in on the clinical trial and so on and found that you were Hala, you were doing this uh, very interesting trial and uh, so I'm happy that uh, I had the chance to participate in the meta analysis and to. Uh, help with this revision. So uh, I have been trained uh, in Dublin at the Coombe Hospital for manual rotation, and I remember they told me never do it uh, when the head is uh, deflexed. Uh, I happen to believe that uh, a posterior, if uh, if the fetus is left, is very very different from deflex OP. So vertex cephalic OP can be vertex or brow or uh, mm, I mean any grade of uh, any degree of deflection and so we all know these uh, sonographic images if we see by transabdominal ultrasound uh, beyond the probe uh, we see with um, the occiput uh, it means that it's occiput anterior if we see the eyes looking upward it's occiput posterior but we uh, and so I was uh, I was wondering, should we rotate only the the well properly flexed uh, fetuses? Because uh, with ultrasound, also with clinical examination, but probably better with ultrasound, we can distinguish between these two uh, different OP. I can also show you the video. I think. So basically, uh, you can see in um, the transabdominal ultrasound, and then better this way. So by transabdominal ultrasound, you can see the image of the petal eyes looking upwards, starting from the petal belly, then you go down and you see the eyes looking upwards. But if you rotate the probe by 90 degree, you see, in this situation, you can clearly see that the chin is well flexed on the chest. And this is a proper well flexed OP. And I do think it's very much different from, uh, from this situation. Here we have the flex presentation with OP. And we can think it's the same. We see the eye looking upward. But we, if we rotate by 90 degree the probe, you can see that it's very much different because here you see the spine is extended because the chin is very, very far from the chest. This is a qualitative approach. 
And uh, also by transperineal ultrasound, you can also see that the head is so deflexed that you are able to see the fetal eye below the pubis. This is a qualitative approach and uh, also quantitative approach uh, has been described by Dr. Dallasta, Dr. Guy, by measuring the chin to chest angle. So I think uh, ultrasound in labor has, uh, mm -hmm. uh, there is room for ultrasound in labor also here in this uh, decision between uh, rotate or not. That's my point of view. Thank you, Federica, uh, for that. Um, so that concludes kind of our formal, you know, slide presentation. I'm actually looking forward to the next 20 minutes and our, on our discussion, and, and I'll be happy to open it to, to any comments. Does anybody want to start me any, any, any comments or questions? I guess um, people can kind of listen to this and say, well, why should we practice manual rotation? Because, you know, it's only 12 minute, 12 and a half minute difference for second stage, da, da, da. I take the point of view that through our trial, at least being a pragmatic and blinded trial, we have actually shown that there is safety, most likely. We've shown that there is a bit of satisfaction. The women do like the thought of uh, being in having manual rotation and, and having a, a normal vaginal potential chance of a modern vaginal birth. So I say to myself, well, why not? Do we allow, um, yeah, we, we in, in science, we need level one evidence. But in this case, with so many trials, it sounds to me, if we can ensure experience, um, and we know that success leads to, um, to manu you know, a normal vaginal birth, well, I think we should be considering having manual births, in, introducing uh, an, a, a, a training model through simulation or whatever to ensure people are trained and practice manual rotation. That's my point of view. I don't know what others think. Let me emphasize your, your first point, you know, safety. Um, that's what I, I used to say, you know, like, you know, you take call in labor delivery and, you know, they're doing all these model rotations. And I was like, you know, before 2021, I mean, we don't know much about this at all. You know, we don't know if it works. Um, we don't know if it's safe. And, and I think the most important point to me, it's also safety. You know, the fact that when you put it all together, as Julie did, it's almost one in 500. You know, you had the one core prolapse in your trial and the baby did well anyway because you detected and the baby did fine. So it didn't cause more lacerations. It didn't cause more, more problems to the baby, trauma, you know, the things we were fearing. So it was safe for mother and baby. Um, so, so I think that that's... A, the first point we can emphasize on this um, call after a thousand patients have been randomized. Uh, any comments on safety otherwise? I totally agree with what Hala was saying. I think that it would be a shame if someone read these data and suggested that we shouldn't be training in manual rotation um, because I think Brad's emphasis on the patient satisfaction piece that the providers tried to do everything to get patients the, um, the outcome that they wanted, which obviously is so important. I was talking about this live stream with one of my former nurses, and she was telling me that just last week, she had a patient who was a, a multi, he had prior vaginal birth, she was clearly occiput posterior, and pushed for three to four hours and no one tried to do a manual rotation and she tried to advocate for that with the providers and the response was that the evidence didn't support that. Um, and I would argue that it does, um, but certainly there are different ways that people may interpret these, these data. Brad, satisfaction came up a couple of times and when you talked about it, you know, and, and it seemed to favor the rotation arm, you kind of brushed it aside. We don't know how this happened, but can, can I push you to uh, expand on your comment? Well, I, I find that very difficult. So, um, like, the women didn't know whether they had a randomized a, a, a manual rotation or not, I presume. So, I therefore presume that satisfaction didn't depend on that knowledge. Um, we had a cutoff on a visual analog score of five, and if above five was satisfied and, and less than five wasn't kind of arbitrarily, and, and we found this difference. But we, when we analyze the data as continuous in a, a sort of non-parametric way, um, which should have more information, actually there wasn't a difference. 
Um, to, to be honest, whether I think women are satisfied with care and, 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 and their experience in labour, but I found it really difficult to figure out why women would be more satisfied if they actually had a manual rotation. Or well, maybe the blinding wasn't as good as we thought. I'm not Can sure. I just add to that, Brad? From someone who used to see the women after they've had their baby have, being participants of the trial, that they believed they had it when they didn't have it. <laughs> so they... They, awesome. by being part of this trial, and they end up with a normal birth or they end up not having a cesarean section, they really thought they've had manual rotation. So I think, um, it, 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 is it positivity or whatever? I, I'd like to think that uh, satisfaction is a, is a factor as a result of our long-term follow-up. We were the only RCT that's undertaken follow-up up to one year. So I would actually take the point that we should be taking notice of the satisfaction outcome from this R trial. You know, some, some of my mentors tell me that every trial, you may like this comment, the primary outcome should always be maternal satisfaction. Shouldn't be how many C-sections, shouldn't be how many restorations, shouldn't be how many low upcars, should be maternal satisfaction. And, and yeah. you actually, there was significant in your trial in favor of rotation, which is... Yeah. Amazing. And, you know, we need to study more. I'm, I'm not, you know, I don't think it's the end of the story, but I think that it was a wonderful, a wonderful thing. Can, um, and I know we have, I, I don't want to give too much, too much away, but we have two of our, of our um, panelists here who just had babies, uh, Johanna, uh, what, five days ago? How many? Nine, nine days ago. Nine days ago. Fiona Joy. <laughs> She was just born, and, and Federica had, had her baby about four months ago now, and she may need to leave to to pick him up. Yeah, but I this is this is a a big deal, you know, the, the, what we're talking about for so many. Uh, thank you for being with us, uh, Federica. Let's talk about the diagnosis and the and the and the and the, and, and the fact that all the trials, uh, as Julie said, use ultrasound to make the diagnosis. Uh, maybe some of you can comment on how important you think it is. Because I show that OP and OT kind of sometimes spontaneously resolve, you know. I think we should say today that we, you should never do a mild rotation in the first stage. Most of the time, those resolve anyway. And some in the second stage resolve. So I guess comments on, should we always make the diagnosis by ultrasound before we do a mild rotation? I, uh, Brad, do you want to comment? Yes you should always do that. I think under, ultrasound is underutilised in labour in general. Um, but, you know, we've all seen, or well, hopefully not, but I think we've all seen occasions where, where during our training, you know, the consultant has rotated the baby and uh, using the Keelan's forceps or something and then pulled the baby out in a posterior position. Um, and I think there's, there's never any excuse for that. Um, and I think there's also no excuse for diagnosing, you know, the, the posterior position on, on vaginal examination, which we know is incorrect 50% of the time, and then actually turning the baby into the OP position. So so I think ultrasound is absolutely essential before, you know, considering the procedure. And also, as far as midwives, when we did the national survey of, of um, management of malposition, the midwives actually said they'd like to be trained in uh, uh, performing an ultrasound uh, at the bedside in, 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 in the birth setting. Uh, and I think that that is a big factor. And there was over 78% that actually said that. So I, I really think that it, they perceive it to be important. It should be practiced. Um, April 19th, um, April 20th in Australia, We'll have a session about ultrasound and labor, a special issue. We'll talk more about this, but I think that's that's a really important point. And I, and I think I don't want to say it too strong of a word, but should we be my practice? You know, if you do an intervention um, without you know knowing the diagnosis, like in this case, so please do use ultrasound. Um, OP versus OT. Um, can anybody comment on the difference? Look, like some some of your data, for example, Brad, that you talked. Again, you know, we and, and Julie's data it seems like some of the benefits look to be more than the OP, and we know the OP has slightly worse outcomes versus OT. Um, any comments on that? Yeah, look, I, I think um, that there are more data for OP compared with OT. So, so anything in the OT 
so the category has much wider confidence intervals. Um, and in my mind, I, I don't think there's any evidence to suggest that um, you know, manual rotation may be less successful for OT. I mean, having said that, my clinical experience is that OP and OT are kind of different entities. So, so they always need to be looked at um, separately. And the evidence until we undertook our two trials was that they actually either put the transverse position with the OA or the OP in the studies. They didn't, it was not uh, recognized as a separate entity. And I think that's, it's very important to, to, to now know that it is a separate entity, as Brad said. Yeah. Which leads me to the same, to the, the next thing, which is timing, you know, of, of intervention, you know, which I think it's key in this case, you know, we say not to do it in the first stage, but when do you do it in the second stage? Um, and, you know, most of the trials did it kind of early, but maybe you guys can, can also comment on pop out and turn out on, on the, on the, on the timing, you know, like, you know, you're complete, you think you're OP, you do the ultrasound, it is OP, you do it then, do you wait? You know, there's a whole controversy about here, if you push right away, if you don't push right away, do you do it during pushing, not pushing? I know it was done differently in some of the trials. I can tell you in my career, which is now too long, you know, as a resident, I used to tell people push right away. Then for about 15 years, the run of my study say don't push right away. Now after the, the, the Cahill trial, I say push again, not totally pushing. And and how does how does you know my rotation kind of correlate to that? We, we, for our trials, we elected to take a kind of a in-between view based on the available epidemi epidemiological evidence and also our clinical experience. So, so there were some uh, observational studies in France that suggested that manual rotation was less likely to be successful if it was performed towards the end of the second stage of labour, uh, presumably because the, the fetal head might be more impacted in the maternal pelvis. And they found, I think, something similar if it was performed very early in the second stage of labour as well. Um, and I guess this is more my clinical experience now, but I think if, you know, the head is still relatively high and you perform a manual rotation, you know, there's a perception in my mind that, that the baby can, you know, more easily turn back, revert back to the posterior position. So we decided that, you know, when the mum either gets the first urge to push, presumably the baby's head's a bit lower then, or, or waiting an hour into the second stage of labour, just giving the baby's head a little bit of a chance to come down. But that's, I, I think different authors will argue a little bit differently there, but that, that's, a, that's the view that we took. You know, that, that that's so, so, so important. Uh, maybe I can ask, uh, and I think we need, we need more data uh, clearly to to understand this well because um, again, some are going to resolve. You know, do we in the states, for example, we're very keen to minus two, minus three. You know, station yeah. minus one. I don't know. Maybe Ali, you want to comment on that? You know, do you well, wait for a particular station, for example? I, I think we need to review our data. Obviously, we collected all that data, but I really do think that station and flexion are the two areas yeah. um, that we really need to undertake further research and explore because I really think a higher head and a, and, and a deflex head obviously will impact on, on outcomes. So I, I, I think we need a lot further research on that one and, and my, my gut feeling it does make a difference uh, to success of manual rotation, yeah. Yeah, maybe maybe deflection would be a relative contraindication. Give us some of the data, and then and, and you know maybe high station as well. You know maybe you have more drop cords. Yeah. But, but it'd be interesting yeah. to look at your at your data. And, and again, I'm going to ask Joe next a question. And you know, I guess she's blinded. You know, she. How do you do? How, how do you do? For example, you know, well, let's talk about technique. You know, how do you do the, the yeah. routine, You know, because we're talking about station. Some people elevate, some people don't, you know, your fingers may be bigger or smaller than mine, you know. What, what do you do, Joe? Yeah. It's interesting. I think there's so many different aspects to talk about here. Also timing with contractions and pushing versus waiting and doing it in between contractions and when do you destation. Um, I was trained by 
um, an obstetrician who really recommended doing it in between uh, contractions with a whole hand. And I think it, it depends what, what um, your training is. You know, I was trained to do that. I had several successful experiences. And so I felt comfortable with that and thus have trained others in, in that way. Um, and I, you know, one of the questions Hala brought up simulation, um, you know, I, I'd love to hear Hala and Brad's thoughts. We see huge geographic differences in, for example, forceps use um, and a, a, a loss of young trainees comfort with active birth. And I think manual rotation has a risk of becoming one of those lost arts. You know, what do you think is the best way to train the next generation of obstetricians to make sure that that these are done safely because i honestly the data points to both whole hand and digital rotation just because i tend to do it whole hand doesn't mean that others listening should do it that way i think i think brad having um, um rotated a huge number through our from our pilot right to our the two trials i think brad maybe you should say about your own experience and your success rate and your how you turn the baby Look, uh, so um, I think in the French trial, I think by Julie Blanc, they used the whole hand and they had the woman in stirrups and, and, and um, they reported a success rate of nearly 90% in terms of the baby turning to the OA position and they found a difference in, um, in um, operative delivery in their particular trial. Um, and, and that sort of links in a little bit with operator experience. So I, I wasn't really going to say this, Harla, but I, 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 I do a, a manual, I, I do a digital rotation, which is using your two fingers, usually in the lambdoid suture in a kind of a dial-up technique, a bit like using an old uh, telephone, like just dialing around with your two fingers. I know a lot of people don't know what that is anymore, but, but, but um, that's something that I was taught to do, and I tend to do it during a contraction. And we had lower reported success rates. Um, however, I've analysed our plop out and turn out data just, basically I personally did about 30, uh, more than a third of all of the manual rotations in the two studies. Um, and, and I think our data suggested that experience might itself might make a difference. And I remain convinced that operator in a, with experienced operators, probably it does improve the outcome, the outcomes that we're looking at. So um, the differences in the two, trial combi two trials combined were about 70% versus 60% operative delivery. When I just looked at the, you know, the, the outcomes from that one experienced operator using the kind of a dial-up technique. So, um, you know, I think either technique is probably effective. Um, I think that um, using your whole hand, um, there may be a risk of a cord prolapse because I think you're more likely to push the baby's head up a little bit and probably that would ideally be done in the centre where you can get access to an emergency caesarean section straight away. Um, but, but for me, I think operator experience um, is a big issue and, and therefore training um, becomes important, I guess. So, so let me push you on, on that point. Sorry, Anna, real quick. Mm -hmm. So, Brad, it sounds like you did a lot of the um, yeah. procedures, I guess, both sham and, and intervention, right? In the, yes, the yeah, that's right. Yeah. And did you do an analysis looking at your outcome? You know, if, if, if you looked at that, Brad, how are you did? For me, personally, I did. Um, and the, the rates of operative, to, I only did it like yesterday for this talk. And, and I, I had a quick look after we published out of curiosity. Look, the rates of operative delivery for me personally were 70%, uh, 71%, I think, in the sham arm and 51% and in the manual rotation arm. P, P was 0 .0, less than 0 0.02 when I looked at that. And it's kind of a post hoc analysis, um, but it does kind of agree with our pre planned analysis by operator experience, which was trending in that direction anyway. So for me, I suspect, I strongly suspect that with operator increasing operator experience that you might have um, more benefit from the procedure and can i also add that um manual rotation for people that have small hands where the obstetricians or midwives 
is 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 um, was performed a lot with our own uh, investigators, uh, obstetricians mainly, and that we, as you said, we only had one court prolapse, uh, and I don't think that was from a manual. So I'm just saying that I'm not sure that we have a. Um, while it is a risk, we didn't find manual rotation using the hand actually led to poor outcomes. Of the obstetricians that used it, like Sabrina, who only used the whole hand, uh, Joe Ludlow. So the obstetricians with small hands had successes and yet they didn't have poor outcomes. So once again, we need more information about which one is more effective, but I think both of them are effective depending on the operator's experience. But I love that now we have the data when we're consenting our patients to say there's a less than 1% risk of cord prolapse because mm -hmm. we should consent our patients before we do this. And, and now you've provided us with, with those data, which we appreciate. Let me uh, push it a little bit further. Um, we're in the last uh, four or five minutes. So most of the time it works, no matter what the technique is. And I think all trials show that, you know, and sometimes an amazing success rate. You know, you check by ultrasound before, you make that not, you checked after, changed. So it's very, so to speak, you know, level one evidence, you know, ob objective, you know, by ultrasound. But some revert, you know, obviously like Brad uh, implied before. So the issue of, you know, if it's a good thing, should we, how should we repeat it that often? How, you know, how much do we check? Mm. Look, I, I know that a, a few of the senior people, experienced people in our trials um, did repeat some um, procedures at various stages in the second stage of labour as part of their routine practice based on clinical experience. Um, but, you know, obviously the, the data is a little bit less in that regard. You know, if, 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 the, if the baby turns back to OP, whether you should perform the procedure again. Um, I, I think... Um, you know, it's it's a reasonable thing to consider. Yeah. Any other comments on anything as we approach uh, uh, the top of the hour? Any um, any other thoughts? Uh, we talked about safety. We talked about effectiveness. We talked about technique. Mm. I think one of the things that we weren't able to tease out in the data is, is success with no lips versus multips. And is there more value in multiparous patients or no lips patients? And would that affect your rate of vaginal delivery more? Um, and as well as this continued discussion of timing, what is the optimal moment for doing it? I think it's very important uh, to appease the, the critics to ensure we're not turning babies that will turn by themselves. So I think when it comes to timing, um, doing it immediately at the beginning of second stage, um, I, I, I would hesitate to say that that should be a good idea. I think we need to uh, wait until um, there's like, I think how we did it is 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 a, probably a good way to time prophylactic manual rotation. Um, and I, I also think um, work hard on the training Let's, let's make sure people are experienced. And, uh, and um, I'm, I'm working with the, one of the uni key universities. We're, we're looking at a birth simulation model that actually not only will teach manual rotation, but also this is with me mechatronic engineers, but also to kind of um, uh, just uh, instrumental delivery or, or even vaginal examination instead of training on a woman Let's train on a birth simulator that is as lifelike as possible, um, so that uh, our women aren't uncomfortable and we we know what we're doing when we are caring for them. So I think that would be something in the future that we need to work on and and see how is eff efficacy. Wonderful comments from from everyone, and you know we didn't talk about it, but. Um, Therapeutic, you know, minor rotation. There are some non-randomized, you know, data, and it, that that doesn't seem to work. So certainly. Meaning, you know, you don't want to wait, you know, if you're pushing three hours and the head is stuck there, you know, that doesn't seem to work, at least from the, the retrospective data published. And it's interesting in all six trials, it's some kind of prophylactic instead, but in the second stage um, maneuver. Thank you, Dr. Phipps. And thank you, Dr. DeVries. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bird. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Chris Nelson. I had prepared uh, before we started um, a couple of finishing slides, you know, 
be patient, wait till the second stage. You're going to be OA anyway most of the time, and uh, and don't do manual rotation in the first stage. Um, confirm, um, as we say, you know, the diagnosis by ultrasound. Um, I think we actually decided that, that we need to assess flexion deflection. Um, some people do the all end actually that that's wrong you know that the, the, you guys did it with fingers as brad decided so you can do it either all hand or or fingers um i think we should check success by ultrasound if any most trials um, should we repeat it or not it's a, it's a it's a question um and uh um i think that the the consensus is if you don't do this procedure you know there's not overwhelming data that it's the panacea cures everything but we do all do it i think i'll continue to do it you all we all continue to do it and i think that uh, uh there seems to be shorter labor there seems to be an experience and less operative vaginal delivery which is big time uh, especially in the sub analysis of flexed um, mr and um and uh and and, and those are all uh, all great things i think that uh let's see if i can do this I want to bring Federica. Can you bring you back? I see you, but here we go. Uh, I think Federica has joined us back, which is, uh, which was not planned, but uh, it's a beautiful thing. And uh, uh, as I uh, thank all of you, here is the next uh, uh, one next week, uh, seven five p.m. Eastern. Uh, I guess we'll be again eight a.m. in Australia. We'll do a session again live at Age of or live. At Jogam FM, we focus on so many randomized controlled trials, and our focus, as you saw today, was just on level one. Mm -hmm. And we'll see how many hundreds and hundreds of randomized studies are in obstetrics, the quality, um, and and we'll talk about randomized studies with this wonderful um, guests. Um, we have um, after that on April 12, we'll talk about COVID vaccine acceptance with some experts, and as we say, we'll talk about ultrasonic labor after that. There's a bright future and a, a clear sky, as you can see from the from the slide here. I cannot thank um, enough uh, the, the the speakers uh, today. It's been great to do such a wonderful collaboration from across uh, across the world. I thank um, all of you for uh, being uh, with us. Uh, thank you for sending the the research to us. I think uh, it's wonderful to uh, broaden it, you know, across the, the seven continents and to have uh, such wonderful intercontinental. Um, you know, uh, kind of, you know, discussion. So thanks. Uh, thanks, everyone, for, for Thank you. today. Thank thanks you so much. Yes. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.